Hello, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Christian Despina, and we're delighted to welcome back our friend and guest host, J.L. Bell, the author of The Road to Concord, How Four Stolen Cannon Ignited the Revolutionary War and also creator of the popular blog, 1775. Today, we'll be speaking with Nina Sankovich, and we're going to discuss the three leaders of the Boston Sons of Liberty in the years preceding the revolution, as well as their wives and their families. Nina Sankovich has written books about a range of topics, including the pleasures of reading and the pleasures of letter writing. In the Lowells of Massachusetts, she traced the fortunes of one family that rose to prominence just after the American Revolution. Her latest book goes further back to how the, that revolution began in Massachusetts, and in particular to three intertwined families. American Rebels, how the Hancock, Adams, and Quincy families fanned the flames of revolution, explores how the desire for independence cut across class lines, blending people together as they pursued their common goals of liberty, opportunity, and stability. Welcome, Nina. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm so happy this worked out. So happy. To be we, we really appreciate it. So let me just ask you this. So your book, American Rebels, it starts in the town of Braintree, which is now Quincy. So what was that place like in the mid 1700s? And what was its place in the British Empire? Well, uh, it was a small village, um, but it had three churches, um, had a thriving community. It had actually a very interesting history because the area where Braintree was um, happened to have been uh, the same location um, that uh, a lot of different sort of rebellious activities took place long before the American Revolution. For example, the, um, the first uh, English settlers that came uh, included a man, Wollaston, who brought along with him a bunch of endangered, indentured, endangered and indentured, um, <laughs> men and men who he planned to sell the fishing ventures up and down the coast. Um, and along with them was, uh, was a wonderful guy, Thomas Morton, well, wonderful in, in my view, maybe not everybody's, but he was an entertaining fellow. And um, he decided that he just loved this land of Braintree. Um, and he, he um, Wollaston went down south to try to find places to sell his men to. And, and Morton told the men on the hill, hey, look, you can be free. Join me. Let's set up a community here on this hill. Um, we'll call it uh, Marimont, View of the Sea. And we're going to get along with the Native Americans. We're going to sell them arms and we're going to get furs. And, and then they set up a, a thriving economy. Um, but of course, first the, uh, the settlers at Plymouth and then later the Puritans did not like these goings on because they had big May Day parties and they fraternized with the Native Americans um, in all kinds of ways that were upsetting to the, uh, to, the, to the pilgrims and to the Puritans. And so finally Morton was evicted, sent back to England, town was burned down, and the governor Winthrop of Massachusetts Bay said, okay, now we're gonna make sure this land gets into the hands of good congregationalists. That included the Quincy's, uh, who had recently arrived from England and the Coddingtons and the Hutchinsons. Well, one of the Hutchinsons was Anne Hutchinson, who said, I uh, may be a congregationalist, but I'm a different kind of congregationalist than all of you because I'm a better congregationalist. I speak directly to God, you all don't. Governor Winthrop, you don't know what you're talking about. I can leave these people. The Congregationalist Church cannot. Oh, so she was kicked out, kicked out of Massachusetts, kicked out of the church. And then the, uh, the hill that had been going by the name of Mary Mount was then recalled Mount Wollaston. And, um, and finally, we think, okay, we're going to settle down. But no, then we have the Hancock, Quincy, and Adams families all um, come to this village. The Quincy's are already there. The Hancocks come through Reverend John Hancock, who comes to be their pastor in the early 18th century of the third parish church. He's going to be the minister there. Um, the Adams have been there already for a while. And they really represent three different, what was, what was so fascinating to me, not only is to find that the Adams, Quincy, and Hancock families were all living in Braintree, um, but that they all represented different classes within Braintree. Now, there was not this, this big divide, this big class structure in the 18th century village in New England. It was everybody lived side by side. Um, everybody went to the same schools, same churches. So, but it was that the Quincy's were sort of the landed gentry. John Adams' family were the yeomen uh, and the Hancock's 
were, were the ministers and then John Hancock, through his uncle, became the newly rich. So I found these, these three families and these three families all came to support revolution against England, came not only to support it, really to lead it. And not only the men of the families, but the women of the families. We have Abigail Adams, who, who really grew up, uh, spent much of her childhood in Braintree. She was a Quincy on her mother's side. Um, we have Dolly Quincy, who married John Hancock, uh, who's Quincy, grew up in Braintree. Um, and then the other women who came into the lives of the men, like Josiah Quincy's wife, Abigail. And so we have these men and women, different classes, all becoming fed up with the way England is managing their colony and all becoming leaders in the move for independence. It was such an incredible community to study in that way right. because it had all the elements I was interested in. Right. Thank you. you you've uh, told us a little bit about uh, the Reverend John Hancock and how he came to uh, Braintree. Um, tell us about Deacon John Adams uh, what was his role? How, how important was he in the community? Uh, and also how Josiah Quincy Sr., the uh, father of the patriot you focused on, uh, how he made his money. Okay. Well, uh, so Deacon Adams um, was, it was a uh, solid, solid, solid citizen. And it was uh, when he finally was able to own his own property that he became deacon and also had a voice in, in the politics of his little village of Braintree. And he was very active, very active in his village. He felt a real responsibility to his community. Um, and he had these children, John, Peter, Elihu. He was married to uh, Susanna, who, Susanna Boylston, who came from really a higher class background than Deacon Adams did. But she married Deacon Adams and moved to his farmhouse. And because he was such a giving soul and was always wanting to help his community, they had people in and out of their not very large house just constantly, not only relatives, um, but anybody in the town who needed a place to stay. If someone had become homeless, he'd say, oh, come on in and, and live with me for a while. Susanna was not crazy about that. <laughs> she didn't like all this, these people coming in out. She didn't like her husband giving money away. She tried to manage the finances. What that meant is that the household that John Adams grew up in was quite topsy-turvy, a little bit chaotic, um, but it also, hit, for John Adams, his father was a hero. He was such a giving man, so generous to his community, so caring uh, and looking out for his sons. So that's John Adams' story. Um, chaotic background, solid yeoman farmer. Then we have the Quincy's. There are a bunch of Quincy's living in Braintree and John Adams knows them all. He goes to school with them. And later uh, he will um, join them all at Harvard, although he'll uh, join them a little bit later than they all go because he needs to, to make up some, some, some work. <laughs> um, so Josiah Quincy, he, <laughs> He makes his money because he is somebody who, um, who imports and exports things, mainly imports things. And he travels all around the world. Um, and then by chance, one of the ships that he owns along with his brother, Edmund Quincy, who also lives in Braintree, happens, it's a small ship, but they come up across a big Spanish galleon in the middle of the night off like the coast of Gibraltar. And they say, I think we're, we can take this. So they, this big Spanish galleon surrenders to this small ship because it's nighttime and they don't really realize that it's a small little ship with not a lot of arms or a lot of men, but they surrender. And it turns out to have a fortune on board, a fortune, most of which will go to the Quincy family. It's, a, it's the business of Quincy, Quincy and Jackson. Um, Edmund and Josiah's brother-in-law, Edward Jackson is their, is their partner. Um, and it just makes a fortune for Josiah and for Edmund Quincy. And uh, both of them have homes in, uh, have homes, well, Josiah has a home in Boston, Edmund has a home in Braintree. They both make their homes that they have beautiful and they both buy more homes. So Josiah Quincy is going to build a house in Braintree. Edmund's going to beautify his house in Braintree. Um, now Edmund goes through that money pretty darn quickly. <laughs> and he is the father of Dolly Quincy, who will become Dolly Hancock, Dorothy Hancock, um, John, John Hancock's wife. She's uh, 
the youngest child, and she really experiences this um, sort of wealth. The family had always been comfortable, but all of a sudden they're wealthy. But she will also experience the downturn when Edmund goes bankrupt from spending so much money. So her attitude towards her attitude towards security, uh, money, family stability is all I think formed by her childhood, and makes her more um, sort of open to the idea of independence from England. But interestingly enough, she is not so eager to um, marry John Hancock as you think she might be. She, their courtship is very long and drawn out. And I think part of that reason, part of the reason is she just has to be sure about anything she's getting into. Hmm. You know, one of the things I loved about your book is that you really paint a personal picture of all these people because you can really relate. You talk about heartbreak, you talk about loss of fortunes that you just pointed out when they captured that Spanish ship and then they spend too much money. But I wanted to focus a little bit on John Adams, right? Because he's on a lower socioeconomic rung than the Hancock families, the Quincy families. And when I'm reading about you describe his childhood, he prefers farming to schooling. He comes from a little bit of a volatile uh, parental relationship, but yet his own relationship with Abigail is one of a lot of loving. And I love that you pointed out that he wrote in one of his letters that he talked about, you know, a thousand kisses or something like that, that they had exchanged. But can you can you explain to us sort of this metamorphosis that, that transforms John Adams into a scholar, a voracious reader, uh, a lawyer, and, a, and really a, a rebel? Right, right. Well, it is true that uh, when he was young and, and uh, what I guess what we would call probably junior high age for us, he really hated school, he did not want to go to school. He said to his father, I want to be a farmer. And his father sent him out to the field to see if hard work could, could rid him of that idea. But John's like, no, I still want to be a farmer. And finally, he admitted to his father, my school teacher is terrible. He's right. lazy. He's mean. He's, he's just a bad teacher. And so... This is such a credit to, to, to the father that he said, okay, well, we're going to find you a better teacher and we're, because education is everything um, and we are going to get you educated. So that was the role the father played. Now the mother, I think also had a role to play in John's ambition, which is that she always felt she was a little bit better than everyone else in Green Tree. She came from a better background. She lived in a bigger house and she instilled in John, you're better than this. You're better. So once John uh, found, or once his father found the right teacher for him, he became an avid student. He, he, his new teacher gave him a copy of Cicero. He, he carried that copy of Cicero with him basically for the rest of his life. Um, he be, and he internalized these ambitions of his mother. And I think he saw his childhood friends like John Hancock being elevated and right. finding riches. And it kind of peeved him a little bit because John Hancock's riches came through his uncle. You know, what had John done? John Hancock hadn't done anything special in John Adams' opinion. So he set this personal challenge for himself. I'm going to work hard and I'm going to succeed. And what I love about John Adams is you go through his diaries and he kept diaries, which are wonderful. And it's so great that, that we have them. And you can see that just like all of us, he would set these big goals. I'm going to study. I'm not going to drink. I'm not going to chase women. And then a week later, we're like, oh, well, okay, not today. I'm going to study. Again. So he would keep sort of not quite reaching his goals, but keep striving for them. And slowly, slowly, he did reach all of his goals. But he definitely had a much harder row to hoe than, than, his, than his fellow uh compatriots from Braintree. You know, for example, Samuel Quincy also became a lawyer. And um, to become a lawyer, you went through Harvard and then you did a, a, a clerkship. Well, Sam Quincy got a great clerkship because his father was connected. John Adams didn't get a great clerkship. He was out in the boonies doing, you know, this law that didn't really interest him. But he, in fact, he was a teacher for a while before he went into the law. But he just kept going and going. And sometimes um, I wonder, like, what did Abigail see in him? He could be such a, you know, <laughs> such a peevish, complaining type of guy. But I think that's what she saw in him, that he really was driven by ambition for himself, 
But coming from his sort of father's influence, he also had incredible ambition for his community and he, you know, for whom he felt was in his community. And he, that's what made him the rebel that he became. He cared so much for the people of Braintree and the people of Massachusetts, and he wanted their rights to be recognized. And if the British weren't going to recognize them, well, then we don't need the British. And we can lay at his feet, really, the construction of the American government and the papers that he wrote, you know, the, the canon on feudal law, it set the whole course for the American government. And, and I'm not sure um, everyone realizes that, but what I really tried to do in my book was show these incredible people from history were human beings yes. with exactly. their foibles and their flaws and their loves and their disappointments. Um, and to me, that just makes them so much more heroic. Yes. And I love that you added that he signed his name six times on that copy of Cicero. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> my book, this is my name, my name. And yeah. I see that a lot in schoolboys books. They're really proud many of, them, <laughs> of that little property that they have. Um, you've, you've alluded to John Hancock's story a couple of times, but I, but I want you to uh, tell us how he went from being, I mean, he was, he was uh, the third John Hancock in a line, at least. His grandfather was a very respected clergyman. His father was a clergyman. And then suddenly when his father died, well, because they were a minister, the, the house they were living in belonged to the town or to the congregation. So he and his mother and his uh, younger siblings didn't even have a home and they mm -hmm. had to move in with grandfather. And how did he go from that to owning the biggest, grandest yeah, house yeah. on Beacon Hill? Yeah, and it really was an incredible transformation because as you say, once uh, Reverend John Hancock died, you know, the, his wife married the kids, they were homeless. Uh, John Hancock, Reverend Hancock's father took them in, they went to live in Lexington, but there wasn't, it wasn't a luxurious life. The boys were not going to go to school. They were going to go to work. Um, the widow was going to go to work. There was, there was not going to be any luxury in John Hancock's life, but uh, John Hancock's father had a, um, had a brother, Thomas Hancock, who at the age of like 13 went to Boston and started um, a internship, uh, a clerkship, whatever we would call it, with a, with a book binder. And he, when he reached the end at 21, done his seven years service, he started his own bookshop. And then he quickly, he was talking about ambition, he quickly started to not only trade in books, but at all these, he started to trade in, in anything coming in and out of Boston. Um, he got married to uh, a fel uh, the daughter of a another bookseller who'd also branched out into all kinds of industry. And he built this incredible mega fortune out of trading just about anything, selling just about anything. He built his own ships. He made a lot of money during the French and Indian War because he supplied the British with the food, clothes, arms, anything they needed for the war. Um, so he made a lot of money off of that war. And he loved his wife and he built this big mansion for her on Beacon Hill. And the only thing they didn't have was a child. So when John Hancock was orphaned, they said, you know what, we're gonna raise that boy and we're gonna raise him like our own. And they went to Lexington and picked him up and brought him back to Boston and gave him, uh, they tutored him for a while because he was uh, sickly as a child. And I had not really, I'd never known that about John Hancock, about how sick he was during so much of his life. And yet he mm -hmm. kept going. Um, and then he ended up going to Harvard and, and um, following in the footsteps of his uncle. And his uncle left his business to him when he died. And, and, and that's how John Hancock came into his fortune. Now, a lot of men would say, okay, that's my fortune, I'm good. And they would have stayed loyal to the king because he was doing just fine. Um, but instead, he put that fortune on the line for his community. For I mean, he, he bankrolled a lot of the early years uh, of agitation. Um, I mean, I could go on and on, but I think, I think I've answered your question about where John Adams got his money. I mean, John Hancock, but I did yeah. Learn, yeah. In the old fashioned way, he inherited it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Well, let's let's kind of switch to Josiah Quincy Jr. and and really he's the least known of these three characters that that you write about. So and and he was he was the only one who wasn't an eldest son. So, what was his personality and really what drove him? Yeah, well, yeah, he what a character. Um, and interestingly enough, he also was very sickly as a child, which meant he was home in bed a lot. 
And what he did to entertain himself was he read and he read and he read and he read. He was a voracious reader and note taker. He wrote in his books, he kept journals about what he read. Um, and he had very strong ideas, again, as passed down from his, from his family, but also I think from the community in which he lived, Braintree, this idea of uh, duty to community, um, of faith. Of, and there was also this sense um, God is on our side in America. He's, you know, God brought us here. God made us flourish. God's on our side. So when there started to be problems with England, there was no doubt in Josiah Quincy's mind that God was on the side of the colonists, not the side of the king, not the side of, of parliament. Um, or he certainly wrote that way. He wrote, he was a, uh, his rhetorical flourishes were incredible. Um, and he always couched things in terms of the evils being wrought upon the colonies and how God was going to protect them, but that they also had to fight for themselves against these evils coming from other places. Um, he, uh, so his personality was, was formed largely by, by the books that he read, the, the community that he grew up in, and the illness that he really battled against his whole life. Now, Dr. Uh, Warren was, of course, his doctor, which is a wonderful connection. He, and Warren was the doctor to the Adams and the Adams kids. And uh, as I said, Josiah Quincy, and you know, he was everybody's uh, sort of go-to doctor. And in fact, Josiah Quincy's wife really credited him with keeping her husband alive for as long as, as he did stay alive. Let's talk about uh, the, those three men's wives. Uh, it's, you, you've mentioned a bit, it's, there's a complicated familial relationship linking all three men through their wives, through their marriages, yeah. uh, but also uh, tell us about their, uh, the women's personalities and how each of them approached or didn't approach political matters as their husbands became more and more involved. Okay. Um, this, uh, well, there was Abigail, Abigail, and Dolly are the ones you want to know about Abigail Quincy, Abigail Adams, and Dolly Hancock. Okay. Um, I just have to say, I'm so grateful that her name was Dorothy and not Abigail or Hannah, or, <laughs> you know, because there's such a repetition of names, at least Dorothy Hancock had her, had her own name. They were, they were certainly very different, each from the other. Um, but of course, Dolly, Quincy, and Abigail Adams had known each other for a long time. I mean, Dolly Quincy was a bit younger than Abigail and would always be the little Quincy girl. Whereas Abigail Adams was friends with Dolly's older sisters as more contemporaries. Um, Josiah Quincy's wife, Abigail, came from a wealthy Boston family, very interested in education, founded Phillips uh, Academy. Um, and she very much valued education and she read a lot and she was a good fit for Josiah Quincy in that they both just loved to read and, and, and they both loved their, they were both very, um, devout, but not, not devout in the way where the minister tells you what to do, devout in the way that I know what God expects of me on this earth, and I'm going to do my utmost to, to reach that. So not in a following kind of way, but in a, I've been placed on earth for a purpose. Okay. And um, for Abigail Quincy, who married Josiah, um, that purpose would be keeping her husband's memory alive long after he was gone and raising a son to become the leader that he became, you know, mayor of Boston, president of Harvard, you know, representative, senator, and everything that he was, um, and a, a leading abolitionist, all of these things came out of Abigail saying, I, my purpose is to raise a son worthy of this incredible husband that I lost, and he's carrying on my husband's legacy. So that's Abigail. Quincy married to Josiah, Abigail Quincy, uh, Abigail Smith Adams married to John Adams. She's much more practical. I'm running things around here. She, she's the one who held the farm together. She held that when they were living in Boston, she kept that household going. Her sort of reaction to the British coming into the colony, she had visceral experience of that. She was living in Boston. They lived across the street from where the, when the troops started uh, uh, coming to Boston, 1768, they start coming. They, you know, they're, they are not seen as a, um, oh, great, they're here to help us. They were definitely seen as a um, occupying force, even though 
you know, they were British and, and Abigail, and they, everyone was British at the time. Abigail saw those, those troops as an occupying force and she turned early on against the idea of remaining under control of England. I mean, as early as 1773, she was saying, no, we should be independent. We should be, we should be on our own. We have to, you know, we have to take care of ourselves. So, and that grew out of her sort of practical experience of trying to run a household, get food on the table, keep them above water, because John Adams was always in financial struggles. He was always losing money. He was always um, not making enough. He was always betting on the wrong horse. And um, so she was practical down to earth. Then we have Dorothy Hancock, Dolly Quincy. She did not marry Hancock until 1775. They were together for, for years before then. And everyone says, when are you going to get married? Um, there were rumors that John had someone on the side, um, but Dolly Quincy, her motivations, I think, came from, as I said earlier, she had a, uh, a, a childhood where she was well-educated and often cosseted, but also saw the ups and downs of, you know, what, how finances could go up and down. I haven't yet talked about her father, who's actually one of my just favorite guys in the book, Edmund Quincy, her father. He did have a lot of ups and downs in his life, but he, he was another one of these fellows who just believed God has a plan and I am so grateful for everything he does for me. So he never lost hope. He never was in despair. And I think he communicated to Dorothy, just keep, just keep, you know, just keep trusting in yourself. God's watching out for you. Be grateful for everything you have. And, and Dorothy was happy to, to take that as it came. Um, and she was a great support to John Hancock, even when um, he would say, you haven't written to me, you're not doing anything for me. And she would quickly like, you know, knit him something and say, here you go, here you go, you have to <laughs> And then when they were finally married, she stepped up to the plate completely and uh, really helped him out. He was serving as president of the Continental Congress and he needed, uh, he needed help because he was suffering terribly from gout. So she was basically his secretary and at times the secretary of the whole Congress. So you have these three very different women driven from different uh, sort of uh, desires or, and needs. And, and like Dolly Hancock was, was before, um, before the, the uh, boycotts had started against England. She was very interested in fashion. She loved to dress well. She loved to, to have her ribbons. Abigail Adams was never really interested in any of that, nor really was Abigail Quincy. So it's just interesting to see the different personalities right. um, come through by reading their letters. Abigail Adams, of course, left so many letters. Dolly, fewer letters. Um, Abigail Quincy, fewer letters still. But what we have is that we try to glean as much as we can from the words they left behind. Yeah. And I don't want to belabor this point, but I think it's important. You really kind of answered the question, but I just want to get back to John Hancock for a second, mm -hmm. because something really stood out for me because, you know, we know that the British kind of labeled him. I, I remember this quote, his brain shallow and pockets deep. And, you know, today he's really known for what his signature, his wealth, a little bit of a dandy. But one thing really stood out that you wrote, and it, it was a letter that John Adams had written. And he said, not less than a thousand families depend on Hancock to put food on the table. And that's really an incredible sentence given that the population of Boston at this time is only around 15,000 people. So can you just give us like a minute or two talking about really how important Hancock was not only to the town of Boston and helping those colonists living there, but also how he helped to fund the revolutionary movement? Yeah. yeah. I mean, another amazing thing about that letter is that John Adams himself admitted that because John never wanted to admit, you know, how much John Hancock did. And in fact, much of John Adams' um, financial troubles were alleviated by the salaries that John Hancock funded for John doing work for the Provincial Congress, going his travel expenses to go to the Continental Congress. Um, and he, he knew if he just gave that money to John Adams, he'd never take it. But John Hancock and said that I'm going to pay these, I'm going to fund these, these, these opportunities we have. I'm going to fund this travel that we have to do. And that way it became acceptable. And it, you, what you say is true. He funded so much of the activity that led up to the Declaration of Independence. He, you know, these, um, these actions that the colonists undertook, that those cost money to gather 
to gather the gunpowder you need, to gather the food supplies that you need, to organize people, to hold meetings. All of these things cost money. And he dipped into his coffers to pay for them. Mm-hmm. And then with the what you say about the thousand families dependent, yes, and that was not only through employing people, but he he would he he really helped out all of the poor in Boston. And he also gave supplies that people needed. So his work um, was and it, his work was very generous and it was without this idea of, and what shall I get in return? He really just, once he was in on the movement for independence, he was in all the way and he wasn't hedging his bets and he wasn't right. trying to cover you know, his assets. He really was all in and he was willing to put his fortune on the line. And even um, during the uh, siege of Boston, when George Washington was outside in Cambridge and he said, I really want to bomb Boston, I want to bomb Boston and get those British out of there. You know, a lot of people said, no, you know, we still have property there. Well, John Adams' fortune was wound up in property held in Boston. And he said, go ahead, go ahead. Because this is, if that's what we have to do to get rid of the British, that's what we'll do. Right. Now they ended com- ended up coming up with an even better plan, going up to Dorchester and right. and tricking the British into thinking that uh, that this fort had been built and their bombings were going to undergo. So um, his his property ultimately was not damaged, and in fact, <laughs> when everyone uh, when the British finally evacuated Boston and they and the Americans went in, you know George Washington and his fellow men went in to see how Boston looked. They were very interested to see that John Hancock's house remained in, in good condition. And Abigail, I think it was Abigail, wrote to John Adams and said, on the other hand, Samuel Quincy's house was destroyed because even the British know that the men you admire are the men who stand up for something. Now, Samuel Quincy, we haven't talked about yet. He was Josiah Quincy's brother who remained a loyalist through it all, went to England, did not fight in the revolution, did not support the revolution. But his reasons for doing so are the same reasons Josiah had for, for fomenting revolution. Samuel Quincy also had this commitment to community, but his idea of what his community needed was very different from Josiah's idea. And that's another thing that really interested me in writing this book was why some people coming from the exact same place with the same held sort of uh, ideals would arrive at two different decisions to support and, and stay with England or to rebel against England. You uh, mentioned John Hancock as his, uh, his financial support. He was also a selectman and representative uh, mm-hmm. for Boston by the late 1760s. Adams and Quincy were both lawyers. And as you say, uh, Josiah Quincy's brother Samuel was also a lawyer. Uh, also married into that family was J- Jonathan Sewell, who was John Adams's close friend and a lawyer. And so I wonder, uh, tell us about the, the role of lawyers on law in yeah. uh, what turned out to be a revolution in Massachusetts. Well, and don't forget that Jonathan Sewell married a Quincy. Right. <laughs> so that's all, they're all, you know, marrying each other. And they, yes, a lot of them were lawyers. And um, and a lot of the early arguments um, for the colonists were, were very legal, legal arguments saying, okay, you want to tax us. Josiah Quincy argued, you can tax us, but we have to have a voice in how we're taxed. You violated the law, the British Constitution, which was, you know, a doc, not a document, but a, a series of case law and, and treaties and other things that make up what they call the British Constitution. He said, you violated the British Constitution. They, they, they went at all of the, um, sort of their early protests were almost all formed as legal arguments, as um, legal cases to be brought against parliament, against the king. And so what is interesting is that after the Boston massacre, when you have British soldiers firing on American colonists and killing five of them, um, you have Josiah Quincy Jr. and John Adams representing the British in the cases, in the murder cases. And you th- and Josiah Quincy's father was out. What are you doing representing the British? And Josiah Quincy Jr. said, the law is the law and we follow the law. Everyone deserves a lawyer. Everyone deserves their, uh, their, their you know, just defense. And um, 
the only way we are going to prove that we as a colony are deserving of our rights is if we show we are just as good as justice as anybody, that we are fair and equal. And he and John Adams um, faced off against Samuel Quincy, who was prosecuting the officers. So it was this very strange um, experience. And Samuel Quincy knew it, it wasn't going to turn out well for him no matter what happened. Because if the British officers got off, all the colonists would hate him. If they didn't get off, the royal officers that he worked for, you know, the royal officials that he worked for would hate him. So he, he, he put up a very lackluster case. John Han Adams and Josiah Quincy put up a great case. And, uh, you know, the soldiers basically were, were found not guilty. Two of them were found guilty of manslaughter, got branded, but no one did jail time. No one, you know, uh, was ever hung up. Uh, for any of this. So um, again, it was the rule of law that was so important to these to these colonists. And um, the first case of impeachment in America was brought by John Adams. And he did that to try to get rid of the chief justice of the law court in Massachusetts, because on, uh, the king said, you used to get paid by your fellow colonists, you're now going to get paid by me. And Peter Oliver said, great, fantastic, wonderful. I'm going to get paid so much more being paid by the king. Um, well, Adam thought that was reprehensible. No, you, we want to have, if we're going to have impartial courts, we can't have you, you being paid by, by the king. So he brought a, uh, a case of impeachment. Massachusetts House of Representatives voted for impeachment. Um, and again, this was all legal, legal, legal talk, legal, 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 uh, really trying to show we're not wild men. We're not the mobs because there were mobs, obviously. We're not the mobs. That's, that's my cousin, Sam. <laughs> that's the other people fighting. We are the legal profession. We are, we are staying within the bounds of the law to argue for our rights under the British constitution. Now, Governor Hutchinson refused to, to acknowledge the impeachment and, um, but John Adams said, okay, fine. Well, guess what? You're not going to get any jurors. You're, you can keep having Chief Justice Oliver, but people won't serve under him. And that's exactly what happened. Is that juror said, I will not serve under an impeached judge. I will not come to court. Courts ground to a standstill. And that was really the start of sort of these civil disobedience measures. We're not going to pay taxes. We're not going to pay duties on tea. We're, we're going to dump the tea in the sea. So it was an escalation that grew out of legal challenges to the British, British oppressions in the colonies. Okay, and now to my favorite part of this <laughs> talk, tell us about Dr. Joseph Warren and some of his oh. to these rebels from Braintree. Yeah, yeah. well, he, he um, as I said, he was their doctor. I mean, he, Josiah Quincy, when he was uh, just out of college at Harvard, he was diagnosed with consumption you know what, it's tuberculosis. So that's it, you know, that is a death sentence. Right. Um, and the, the sort of governing logic of the time or the uh, treatment was, you know, you get, you get bled, you have leeches put on you, you, you do all of these sort of very painful treatments. But Dr. Warren said, no, that's not what you need to do. You need to lead a, a sober life, you know, no drinking, no carousing, get a lot of sleep get a lot of fresh air, eat good food. Um, and, um, and Josiah Quincy said, well, that all, I can do all that because I'm not much of a partier the way my brothers are. And he and, and, and Dr. Warren became good friends. They spent actually a lot of time together um, talking and having those evenings. And Warren was a friend of the Adams family also who, who spent evenings at their house. Um, and of course, um, and in addition to having these personal family relationships with the Quincy's and the Adams um, and, and John Hancock, he, he had political relationships with them. He was, you know, he was like Josiah Quincy Jr. He's one of the forgotten heroes of the American Revolution. I mean, we can lay at his feet, you know, the, you know, the, the success of the, of the uh, colonists in, in uh, Lexington and Concord. We can, we can put at his feet, you know, the, just so uh, this wonderful speech that he gave on one of the anniversaries for, uh, of the Mo Boston Massacre, where he was just someone who, who was able to rally a crowd to his, to his side. And um, so he was so much more than someone who cared for their physical needs. He also cared for their, for their sort of social needs and, and, and um, just an incredible man. And one thing that I had not known until I started my research was how his body was identified 
after um, after he he fell at Bunker Hill, and then a year later they finally can after the siege of Boston is over, he and uh, his brothers can go look for his body, and they bring Paul Revere along. along not only because Paul Revere was a friend, but because Paul Revere had been Warren's dentist and knew what was in, you know, what were the sort of teeth that were in Warren's skull. And that's actually, even though they were able to do some sort of clothing identification of these very decomposed remains, it was really the first CSI case, <laughs> in, you know, in history where Paul Revere said, I recognize those teeth. I put those in his skull and this is his body. So um, he is an incredible, incredible character. And he's in my book a lot because he was in their lives a lot. You know, as I say, as their doctor, as their friend and as their fellow, you know, co-political, co I don't want to say co-conspirator because it sounds like a conspiracy and I don't want to use that word these days, but he was with them all the way. A fellow rebel. Yes. All right, as of early 1775, John Hancock and John Adams were at the Continental Congress in Philadelphia. What was Josiah Quincy Jr. doing in that season? Well, he, in the uh, fall of 1774, he headed out to England because he had an idea. It was really the sort of the, he had an idea that there was still one chance, one last chance to reconcile with England. Um, and we have to remember this was a time when there was not fast communication between England and the American colonies. Things took a couple months at best. News took a couple months at best to go back and forth. And we, they have the same sort of issues with the press as we have today, which is, you know, what's true, what's not. So Josiah had this idea that news reports in England were painting the colonists in a way that, that the king just didn't really understand what the colonists were really like. And he said, I'm going to go to England. He'd had a diplomatic journey to the South that went pretty well, where he was able to bring a lot of Southerners on board with, uh, with colonial fervor for um, the, you know, fighting for the rights of colonists. And he said, I'm gonna go to England, last is chance. I'm going to talk to the king and I'm going to talk to parliament and I'm going to show them how deserving we are of, um, of having our rights restored and maybe we can have a peaceful reconciliation. So he gets to England and he's sick, you know, he has consumption, it comes and goes, but it, it's, uh, he makes the journey, it's not an easy journey, but he arrives in England um, and he quickly realizes there's no change in the king's mind, there's no change in parliament's mind, they think the colonists are ungrateful, um, undeserving, dirty, rotten scoundrels, and there's not going to be a reconciliation. Um, and he sees that a lot of this has to do with um, sort of what he sees as um, bad dealings on the part of, um, on the part of the parliament, of uh, those in parliament, and this false, um, that the king whom he had had such high hopes for actually had very different ideals than Josiah Quincy had. And he was really affronted by the uh, huge disparities in wealth and poverty in England, by the frivolity, all these plays were going on and dances were going on and money was being spent on all sorts of things. And they were not the good Puritans, uh, the good Congregationalists that he was used to over there in New England. And he was pretty disgusted by what he saw going on. And he came to see, you know, we're not going to get out of this without a war. And he wrote to his wife, we're going, their blood will be shed. You know, we're not getting out of this without a war. He did make contact with some Englishmen and Americans in England who had ideas for how to help the colonists. And there was a plan that was presented to him, this plan that was going to help the colonists in their fighting for their rights. But it wasn't anything that could be written down because there was a great paranoia that the English were reading any letters that passed back and forth. And it wasn't unjustified paranoia. The English were doing that. They were taking Josiah Quincy's letters and reading them. Um, so. Josiah Quincy was given a mission to get on board a ship, go back to America and relay a message about this plan that these people in England had, 
We have no idea what that plan was. We have no idea because Josiah Quincy Jr. never wrote it down. No one else ever wrote it down. Um, Josiah got on the ship. He was very ill and he'd become friends with Ben Franklin in England. And Ben Franklin said, don't go get, you got to get better. You can't go on the board of this ship when you're feeling so ill. And he said, no, I must go. I must go. And he did. He went um, and he made it all the way to the, to the harbor in Gloucester. Um, but he did not make it ashore and he did not uh, did not convey his message to anybody. He was able to leave a sort of a deathbed message by a, a sailor on board. Um, he didn't know anything about Lexington and Concord. He'd arrived right after that happened. Um, and his death was, uh, his death preceded James Warren's death by just maybe a month, I think, or so. And the double blow of both of them dying, it hit John Adams and Abigail hard. It hit the Quincy family hard. It hit the Hancocks to lose two of their leaders in such a short time. And I think, you know, Lexington and Concord was definitely like, as John's written about, it was, that was it. It was, there's no going back. That was the road to revolution. Nothing was turning them back. But to lose two of your most um, sort of soul edifying leaders, people who really drew on the best in you in rising up against the British, to lose two of them in that one season, I think only solidified for Hancock and Adams, we're doing this. We are doing this for the men we've lost. We are not going back because given they gave up their lives for us, we are not turning back. Mm. Would you agree with that? Do you think that? I, I think it's especially interesting that uh, Josiah Quincy, as you said, is is the, the little brother in that family and in this group. And uh, Dr. Joseph Warren was only in his uh, early 30s when he died. So this was the next generation of leaders as well. These are the men that uh, people like Adams uh, in his 40s uh, was expecting to succeed him. And suddenly this generation was gone. Yeah, no, that's yeah. a good point. Yeah. And John, weren't you and I just going kind of back and forth about how many revolutionary leaders were lost in that one year? In yeah. the previous fall, there was a big no. uh, loss with uh, Dr. Thomas Young moving out of town uh, with Josiah Quincy heading off to England with William Molyneux dying suddenly and suspiciously in October 1774. Uh, and then when people like Adam, Samuel Adams and John Hancock were, were headed off to, uh, to Philadelphia, that is why uh, Dr. Joseph Warren had so many responsibilities come uh, the spring of 1775, because there was nobody left except yeah. Dr. Benjamin Church, right. and we know he we... was <laughs> fighting for the British. Yeah, 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 exactly. I've never thought about that, but that is so true, yeah. Yeah, but John, I'm going to defer to the last question to you to close us out. Okay, um, Nina, what uh, surprised you most in your research for this book? Uh, and also, what questions uh, do you wish that you had been able to answer that are still sort of hovering out there uh, in your mind? Uh, because now that you've gotten to know these people. Yeah, uh, I think that um, what, uh, boy, I would like to know, I really would like to know the definite answer of why Dolly took so long to marry John Hancock. I, it's just so curious that they, I mean, no one waited that long. No one had long engagements. You got engaged, you got married, you know, that was it. Um, so that, and maybe it's because she didn't really leave behind many letters um, and certainly no journal, whereas um, John Hancock left so many letters that he's, you know, he signed yours forever, I soon hope to be. You know, clearly he wanted to get married or did he, I don't know. Um, so I'd like to know the true story of that. And, um, and I also was so fascinated. I mean, it's not that I didn't know how wonderful Abigail Adams is, but boy, she really was a trooper in every sense of the word. She held the family together. Um, any refugee that came to her door, you know, at, when after Lexington conquered and people were fleeing Boston, she took anybody in. Um, after Josiah Quincy Jr. died, Abigail came to her, Abigail Quincy came to her door after having, trying to, you know, locate the body and find out what happened to her husband. She came to Abigail Adams for comfort. I mean, everyone turned to her because she was a strong, strong person. And she hadn't had 
a formal education. And yet she wrote these letters to John Adams that are so stirring. And she laid out the arguments for, you know, for, for ending slavery, for giving women's rights, for recognizing the rights of Native Americans. I mean, she laid out things that we should have dealt with then. And she knew that. Um, and John Adams laughed her off a lot of the time. And I love how she would say, okay, laugh at me now, but I'm going to say it again. And then I'm going to say it again. And then I'm, like, she would, she would never just be put off by him. She just was persistent. So I think I was surprised at how really tre tremendously strong Abigail Adams was. Right. Well, we've been talking with Nina Sankovich. This is the book, American Rebels and Nina. I want to encourage people to buy this book. So where can they buy the book? How can they reach you on Twitter? Is there a website they can go to to find out more about what you're doing? Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. My book can be bought, you know, bookstores, uh, IndieBound, um, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, uh, your local, a lot of local bookstores in New England carry it because it's such a New England book. Um, my website is www.readallday dot org, um, which comes back from my first book when I literally did read all day. Um, and um, I'm on Facebook, Nina Sankovich. On Twitter, I'm read all day. And I'm on Instagram, which is my most favorite thing to do because I just post pictures of Abigail, John, Josiah, and whoever, and, and some of their wonderful quotes because they have so many great quotes. Right. Well, we really want to thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having fun. me. And so on behalf of myself, J.L. Bell, thank you for watching today and we'll see you next time.